we got a dose of double Daves today, and also <laughs> part two of our Valentine's gift to you in a real cool ITL. You know the place, Pensado's Place. That was good, Herb. I like that. That was thank that you, was, Dave. That was it's my one contribution. I'm gonna unclip <laughs> now and leave. <laughs> man, you know Dave Ways as well as I do. You man, can... I love the Dave Ways here, man. I uh, know, me too. Uh, hey guys, a special day, special day. Um, uh, we're finishing up with Eric. You guys uh, were very generous and, and, and kind about that show. We really appreciate it. If you get a chance, uh, find Eric. Tell him how much you enjoyed the show. We're gonna uh, we're gonna show the second part of the. Uh, ITL, uh, no no moving umbrellas, no moving mic stands this week, right, Will? Uh, no, no. Uh, but it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, it's been a good week. How about you, Herm? It has. It's been really busy. So, um, yeah. you know, that's but busy is a good thing. And yeah. can't say enough to you guys. Um, the comments, as usual, have just been really insane. I mean, we're we're really so honored that you feel so strongly about it. Uh, the reaction to Eric's show was just just unreal um i know we got we got messages from chile argentina yeah it was really cool and i'll tell you what's funny which you didn't know is, is during the itl last week i had to unclip because i had to go out and do a quick conference call so i didn't watch it literally till yesterday and i was reading all these comments about drumbella and you know all this stuff it was just so interesting I so know. now i can't wait to watch this itl um Let's do what we usually do. Let's get some homework done. Um, at, like I need to tell you where to reach us. My God, we get such great comments. But obviously our Facebook page, you see it up on the screen there. You can watch us on YouTube. Um, certainly hit us at our Twitter handle, at Pensado's Place, which you, which you really do and which we really appreciate, and we try to respond. Um, as we've been telling people, you can catch us live 12 o'clock noon on Thursdays uh, if you want to tune in and get in the chat room. And in our chat room, he's not the DJ, he's the CJ, which is Drew Adams. Drew. Hey, Drew. Give us a point, Drew. Give oh. us like a showbiz point. Drew I Adams. I work on a thing this week. Drew Adams. He's got his Vintage King okay. t-shirt on. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Let's say hello, as you said, as you just said, to our Vintage King partners. Yes. Vintage King. What's up? Drew Townsend is in our chat room as usual. There's his information up on the page, and Drew is always helpful. Hey, so, Drew. So we got a lot of Drews, Drew and Drew and Drews and Daves, Drews and Druids. Um, at the end of the show, of course, we're going to give our uh, Pro Tools giveaway. Stay tuned, we'll have some names and stuff for you. Hang tight, we'll get to that. But now to the meat of it. Uh, man, a lot of you guys keep going. Hey, Dave, can can you mix for me? Duh, that's what I do for a living. Of course, I can mix for you. Uh, so just just just. Let me know, you know, what you want me to do, and if I can do it, I'll certainly help you out with it. But uh, you don't have to, you don't have to be polite or anything. That's kind of why. Uh, there, are, there are some preconditions to you. Well, doing it, but yeah, you got to you got to deal with Herb. I mean, you know, <laughs> make every effort to talk to me directly. I, pr I promise you, everything will be after we <laughs> after we've closed the deal. Don't talk to him first. <laughs> but don't feel uncomfortable because even if I can't do it or can't help you. Or that we've got other options. Obviously, I've got a lot of friends, and so you know we can always help out in, in, in that area. And then, of course, all your questions about relationships and and that you know send directly to Herb. Absolutely, you're good with that, aren't you? Yeah, we're going to start a new segment, Dear Herb. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to what they really want to. Let's do it. Um, so um, this is the continuation of, of the incredible journalistic skills of Will Thompson, who went out and and hung with Eric. Um, couple of weeks ago and was uh, I'm telling you this this let's have a big hand of a round of applause for Will this 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 is I mean <laughs> Will you did a great job man this is really good are you ready to run it Will needs no explanation this is Eric Valentine again and this is a continuation of last week's ITL So, I guess we can talk about uh, the console a little bit. What I'm working on now is this um, sort of Motown-y sounding thing. And I've really been into this, uh, this thing of trying to get drum sounds with just one microphone. And uh, so that's, that's what this is. The, the drums are just, uh, just one channel, one mic. It's the setup that we actually saw out in the sound room a, a moment ago. 
Um, it was just a, a, an, an RCA KU3A just sort of pointed at the center of the kit a few feet away. Um, so... So that's... That's the drum sound, uh, just one mic with a ton of EQ on it. Um, and uh, these EQs have made it possible for me to, um, you know, pull this off a lot easier now. They're so, they are so flexible and um, still remain real musical sounding. And so I can do very, very extreme EQ moves with, uh, without it sounding overly EQ'd. So what we're listening to now has a ton of EQ on it, this, this particular drum sound. So then here it is without the EQ. So all the low end, uh, everything is all being manufactured by the equalizer. And there's a little bit of spring reverb on there. You can hear that guy. That's, that's without the reverb. Got a little bass, piano, vibes. There it is all together. So I can show you what the EQ is doing individually. All right, so for this, I'm actually using every single band of the EQ. Um, so the first thing is enhancing the low hand a little bit with this high pass filter. So it's actually lopping off everything below somewhere around 70 hertz, and uh, but creating a resonance at 70 hertz, and then. Uh, I'm actually boosting high end with the, the low pass filter. And so, so that's boosting. It's a little more subtle, but it's just adding a little bit of uh, air on top of there. And then it's disposing of all of the uh, other high end above, of, above that point. And this is probably somewhere around 15K. It's just creating a little peak and then just kind of rolling off above that. So then um, there's a, a move here that's the majority of the presence. So that's like at about 2K, a really broad uh, lift shelf EQ that's just turning everything up. So then, uh, then I add even more low end with this uh, low frequency band and so there's the meat of the kick drum. And then I added a little bit of body of the snare drum. But this is without it. It's a little thin. That's with it, a little thicker on the, on the low end of the snare. And then, uh, and then I just sort of tucked in some of the high mids a little bit just to make it a little sweeter sounding in the high end, not, not quite so harsh. Add a little digital, uh, little spring reverb. You've got yourself a Motown drum sound. And there it is. Other stuff I've got going on is um, uh, on the console. I've got a, a mixed bypass, and so I can, uh, you know, an, uh, an insert uh, in or out. So I can uh, add uh, mixed bus compression just with this switch. This is without it. 
mess with it. And I'm using this uh, undertone unfair child thing. This is our version of a, of a fair child. It's, it's set really, really subtle for this. Uh, I'm trying to just keep it sounding kind of natural. So it's just a little bit of glue. That's without it. That's with it. So all of this stuff um, that's a part of this track was recorded through this old Studer tape machine on the way in. Um, I set it up at seven and a half ips, so it's just really crunchy sound and really cool old vibey sound. It's a huge part of um, the drum sound, that one mic drum sound. With, uh, without that, it just it doesn't have the same sort of uh, thickness and density in the sound without having the tape compression and distortion and stuff on it. Um, another thing I always like to have is uh, in the control room is a turntable. I pretty much, uh, when I'm, you know, normalizing the console, putting things away, cleaning up, I pretty much only listen to vinyl. <laughs> um, I love uh, old records, old like uh, audio file records. Percussion records, Stereo Rama. They were like uh, an old audio fire file record company, and uh, they sound amazing. It's just uh, great to listen to that stuff and sort of keep in perspective, you know, um, some of the old techniques and technologies that sounded so incredible in the past, and uh, not get lost in uh, the modern digital stuff. Um, we can see a bunch of the outboard gear here. Um, there's a, c a couple other things that I've talked about recently. There's, um, I have a couple, uh, a whole little collection of, of 1176s. I have two black faces and, and one, uh, uh, and two, two blue stripe ones. Yeah, so this guy right here is just an, a magical vocal compressor. And I, I use it on pretty much every vocal all the time. Um, it's always set at four to one. Um, you know, this is usually about where it's set. It's, it's like an attack of one or two, so pretty slow, a release pretty fast, um, just depending on the, the mic gain and stuff, but usually quite a lot of compression, and um, uh, yeah, that thing just always works. It's impossible to set it wrong. These are the, uh, the uh, Orban EQs I really love. Um, I've been using those for a long time, probably 25 years. I, I, I first discovered those, and it was the first really surgical EQ I had ever got my hands on. It changed everything for me. It, it, it was really a significant thing, and you know, and part of why I took the time to design an equalizer for a console that has the same type of power and flexibility that, that those EQs have, where you can get super surgical really um, carve things out, but these are done, you know, with um, the type of vintage Class A circuitry that, um, that I really love the sound of. And so, you know, the Orbans were great because they're very powerful, but they're all based on, you know, ICs and stuff. And, uh, you know, nobody had ever done this before, and I, I wanted to have everything. I wanted, like, I want all the control and the power and be able to carve things out, but I want it to be class A and sound really musical, and you know, there, there it is. We did our best to, to build it. There's um, these things, I've talked about these, these dynamic equalizers, I use these all the time. They are really, really cool, just, uh, you know, kind of uh, not wildly expensive and incredibly powerful tool. I can fight my way out of any crappy vocal recording with, uh, with those boxes for sure. Um, these are all of my favorite bus compressors right here. Um, the 2500, that's actually kind of new for me. I'm sort of a latecomer on that. I know people have been loving that thing for a long time, but uh, I just got that thing maybe four or five months ago. Um, DCL 200, Allen Smart C2, and uh, the Crane Song STC8. I use, those are what I use most of the time for modern stuff. Um, my, my, my beloved distressors. 
use those on, on everything. They're always on the drums. It's actually on this little mono drum thing right now. You can, you can see it bouncing away. Set up with the, uh, the high pass and the peak emphasis, so it's grabbing more of the snare drum and as little of the kick drum as possible to sort of uh, make the kick drum come out louder in the, in the blend. And then uh, this is all my other, my other stuff. Um, you know, just only a handful of digital reverbs and stuff. And um, uh, lots of old tube compressors. These are modified stay levels, modified Altex. Um, these old uh, um, Summit Audio TLA 100s. I had those. I've had those for a long time. I got the first one of those back in the late 80s. It's one of the first ones that they actually put out. I think it's like serial number 11 or something like that. That was the first good compressor I ever owned. <laughs> and then these things, these are the, the you don't have this compressors. I actually mentioned these re recently on a forum. Um, these are pretty funny. They uh, supposedly came out of um, a mastering studio, uh, at a mastering room at Decca Studios in, in London. And um, they're really, really great on vocals. Um, really cool sounding compressors. And uh, there's uh, the Roland Chorus Echoes. I use those all the time. Love those on vocals. They're all over, you know, most of the stuff I work on. Um, bunch of gates. Um, this is uh, my, my friend uh, Jeff Turzo, his FET uh, overstayer compressor. He's making really cool stuff. He actually really helped me out recently because um, I did a surround mix for a live show and I needed a compressor, a six channel compressor that could all link together and so he custom set up um, three of his stereo VCA compressors to be able to do that and they worked awesome. They worked amazing. So, so that's pretty much it. Lots of stuff. I got this old Scully 16 track. I use that for all the drums and bass on uh, the Slash record, this recent Slash record. There's also uh, the second uh, Death Ray record that I did was recorded entirely on that thing. Um, these two machines I've had forever. Um, uh, these were also purchased in that same uh, era when uh, the band T Ride got signed and we were buying equipment with uh, record company album budgets. Um, so yeah, this machine usually is, stays set up as a um, two inch 16 track. And uh, so I, uh, like on the Queens of the Stone Age record, I used that for the drums and bass. And then we did all the overdubs on this machine. And uh, that, same, that same formula was used for the first Third Eye Blind record, um, the T-Ride record. Uh, you know, that was definitely my, my main sort of uh, tape machine tracking setup for a long time, for probably 15 years. Um, everything was done like that. 16 track on the Ampex, 24 track on the Studer. Here's, uh, here's Studio B. So this is uh, a 48 channel undertone console. This one has the natural bronze finish, uh, unlike the... Uh, the Studio A one that has the, the black patina on it. And then uh, you can check out the, the shop. This is where consoles get built. <laughs> Just all the little bits and pieces we need for uh, assembling circuit boards and putting things together. So we have things sort of uh, separated into um, different board categories. So these are all the components that are associated with the, the tube output stages. This is the tube inversion stage, all the parts that are associated with that. Um, these are output boards. These are uh, just general resistors. Over there we have the power distribution, master section board A, the meter boards, all that stuff, all the different parts associated with the different circuit boards in the consoles. If somebody orders a console, it takes about three months to build it. 
Uh, we just, you know, the first thing we do is order all of the parts. Some of those take a little while to come in. And, um, you know, the first thing that shows up is circuit boards. And uh, we actually have a, um, a, a manufacturing place called G&J &J that um, does the initial uh, circuit board stuffing. And then we get them back here and start assembling stuff. And then other things like knobs and face plates and other stuff will start showing up. And then we can, you know, do the stenciling on the face plates and... Um, get the silk screening done and laser etching on the knobs and like there's all these various stages that have to happen in order for things to get finished and then ultimately get assembled and overall it takes about three months to, to build a console. So here we are at the Undertone Audio Factory interrupting Roger doing his wiring. This is uh, a 24 channel console that we're building right now. That's, there's the, the master section there. And uh, go in here. Mike's working on uh, putting mo knobs on. Hey. Here's the little factory. Putting knobs on modules. That's Mike right there. How you doing? There's Dre. Hey. This is Tim. And there's Tim. Tim. So there's, uh, here's all the modules that are going to go in this little 24 channel console. Um, looks like it's very close to being done. I want to thank my friend Busby, uh, Busby Busby, uh, who hooked Eric and I up. Uh, Busby, thank you so much, man. That was that was an incredible, incredible thing. Will did an amazing job. I love that. But now uh, on to Dave Way, my buddy Dave. Um, when I first moved to LA 20 years ago, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Still don't. But uh, Dave and I worked out of Larry West a lot. Dave was there a lot, and. Uh, uh, I, I, I got to be friends with him and uh, learned a great deal from him, and he was very inspirational, helped me a lot. But Dave, thanks for being here, man. Good it's to uh, see you, it's Dave. so good to see you. It's, it's, Welcome. It's, I miss. Good to see you, Herb. Absolutely, man. I miss those days of yeah. just hanging out in the lobby up front and uh, yeah. talking about all the stuff that you do now every week. Right? I know. It's like. Um, our profession is just the greatest thing in the world, but one negative thing is we just don't get to see people, you yeah. know, because we get in our own little caves, and and uh, so it, this show has is, is, is been incredible for me because I get to see my friends again. But uh, I know you've been extremely busy. Let me set this up. Uh, some of my favorite records ever, Herb, Dave, Dave, Dave did Fiona Apple, which is, look those up, look all these up, uh, Sheryl Crow, Shakira, Savage Garden, the big record, the good one. Um, <laughs> Michael Jackson, the big record, the good one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was around when you when you hear jam, when you hear jam off off of uh, off of that record, um, you're listening to you're listening to classic Dave Way, uh, Paul McCartney, mm. Mick Jagger, um, Stevie Wonder, the Foo Fighters. Um, Pink, let me, let me, let me. She's the best, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. We, you and I both did that yeah. record. Uh, I, I love Pink, but uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I, 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 I went to All Music and was looking at, over some of Dave's credits, and I just got tired after page two hundred. <laughs> but the unique thing about Dave Way, and it's always fun to talk about our guests when they're here, you know. As opposed to what you do when, when, when they're not here. It's a whole different here. conversation. <laughs> well, people don't realize this, but after the show's over, I just sit in this chair for a week and talk to myself. Um, it's no, so they, lonely. No, they do realize it. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're actually anxious to hear from Dave, so fire a question. <laughs> oh, man. But um, I forgot my train of thought now. Uh, anyway, Dave. This, this, Dave's won three Grammys, and one of the one of the unique things about Dave. Dave's one of the few mixers that's actually written a number one record. Mm. Um, uh, Kissing Game. The real title is "I Like the Way," right? Uh, Had to get my name in there. That's what, that's what made it go. I never one. thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> but but one of the things I, I want to I want want you guys to get from from our talk with Dave today is uh, Dave. Dave has 
an incredible feel and emotion, and you can tell that he gets that in all his work. But Dave's also highly educated. He's 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 got a four degree four year degree from Berkeley. Um, he's, he's he you can discuss uh, anything musical with him, uh, and you can discuss anything technical with him. I I, I think he epitomizes the 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 heights you can reach in our profession. But Dave, let's just jump right in. When you're when you're mixing, like one of the things I used to be impressed when I'd watch you back in the day when I was trying to figure out what the hell I was doing, you just have an innate ability to to, to get the ratio and proportion. If you were making the proverbial spaghetti sauce, you just throw the right amount of spices in and stir ratio it up. Ratio and proportion, that's exactly what it is. That's, how, do, that's, how, how do you train your ear to listen for that? I don't, I don't know if you actually train your ear for that or, or if it's just a, a matter of like, oh, that's the right spot. That's the, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. if it's, it's training thing. or, yeah, I think that's totally feel, actually. If Do I you think pick about out it. something in the mix and then, and then that you, that like, say you, you listen all the way from start to finish in the song, do you pick something out? Like a snare, like the snare, which is usually a constant sound, right, right, and then right. make sure your vocal is sitting just above that. Yeah, I guess it kind of depends on whatever you you feel like is the the core of the song, because you mm -hmm. know some some songs, even if it's a big production, the vocal is without a doubt the first you know mm -hmm. uh, thing on the, the, the priority list. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm I'm one of those guys where I don't I don't really solo up things, and I don't start with the drums and then you know mm -hmm. add stuff in i kind of un unless it's a total you know groove dance track or something like that maybe i might spend some time just just on the drums mm -hmm. but um for the most part i just try and put up a rough mix of it get the balances as quick as i can to where it sounds like a record mm -hmm. and then you know and that maybe takes half an hour to get where it's like you got everything in and you're like okay and maybe maybe there, as you're going, there's some stuff where you're like, oh, that's confusing me. I don't know what what role that's going to play yet. You should just keep it out, and you can maybe keep two or three things out until you've got what you feel is the general, you know, ballpark. Mm -hmm. And then you start adding in some of these other things as mm -hmm. decorative and finding a spot for it and stuff like that. That's it's usually how I go about it. That's cool. Uh, on a philosoph philosophical level. Um, I think it's safe to say that you and I tend to think of the frequency f spectrum as techniques uh, uh, available for the manip manipulation of like emotions and yeah. feeling. Um, describe like low end, mid range, and, and, and high frequencies in terms of how you how you use those in, in the mix process. Like you would mix right. a, a ballad with certain lyrics with different amount of high end than like say you would something like Genie in a Bottle or something. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I always felt like the the low mids and and bottom are that you know that thing that moves your hips and it maybe gives a sexy quality to it. And and uh, if it's you know if it's a ballad or something that uh, you know you don't want it to sound harsh or you know you want it to be comforting, I'll probably have less mid range because mid range to me is like that's excitement and that's aggressiveness and, and uh, bold statement kind of stuff and you know you sometimes <laughs> uh, uh, she woke up I saw I saw uh, <laughs> he and I had this here. discussion last oh, night oh did you yeah. yeah and then that you know that top end is kind of um, uh, well for, outside of being for clarity uh, on an emotional level maybe that's um, yeah I don't know I don't want to say Sweetness or something, but you know, yeah, sweetness. How about that? Yeah, yeah. But uh, you mentioned clarity in the top end. A, a lot of people want clarity without as much top end. That's not possible, is it? Well, you know what? I mean, you, you, I'm sure you look at it this way too, which is uh, the clarity comes from not only just from EQ and stuff, but from from each thing having its own place and, and arrangement wise, not having too many things that are getting in the way of each other. You know, that Frequency always, wise. Yeah, if you know, once you start to have shakers and hi hats and the the, you know, the high end on uh, on the guitars and, and you know uh, all these things, 
in that frequency range start to c compete with each other, and then you know, panning wise or, or depth wise and stuff, they're competing with each other. Mm -hmm. So if you can, I always try and if it, if it's not sounding clear to me, I'm looking for something that's getting in the way, you know, something oh, okay. that's competing with what I think should be the focal point, whether that's the vocal or the guitar or whatever. Do you ever look at frequencies as being trend related? In other words, like, like, hmm. like 20 years ago, records were, were, some, were kind of brighter yeah. and then they get darker and then brighter and you know darker. What? You, do you, have, you have satellite radio? Yeah. Okay, so I, I do this in the car all the time. You, you, have, you know how they have like 40s on 4 and mm -hmm. 50s yeah. on 5, right? <laughs> yeah. So you, go, you start at 40s and it's like, you know, there's no bottom, there's no top, everything's yeah. like from about, you know, 400 to, yeah. you know, maybe 4K. Yeah. And then you get to the 50s, you're getting a little more high end, a yeah. little more bottom, you get to the 60s, and then you get to today, you know, you, then, you, then you go on to this, uh, current station, and it's actually amazing how much brighter yeah. and how much lower everything is. Yeah. And, and actually, I, I think we've gone too far in that regard in a lot of yeah. ways, because I listen to the 40 station, and you can hear everything. Yeah. I mean, it's it's beautifully. Especially it's in the '40s, that's when the, the the Neumanns and the C12s were brand new, and the vocal sounds are just spectacular when those mics were new. It's like things have degraded Herb over like capacitors have changed and diaphragms have gotten old. And mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> uh, my uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, there. Well, uh, Dave has a trademark. And that trademark I don't is have, that his I don't, elbows will slip off the desk. Uh, <laughs> they're making they're making fun of a <laughs> of a handicapped person. I, I don't have I don't have all the feeling back in my left uh, arm yet, and sometimes I I'm can't sure feel I'm where I'm at on thing. the table. But we'll turn an infirmity into a trademark. <laughs> 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 but my point is, man, those vo some of those vocals on those '40s things really sound. Yeah. Clear well, you know and what bright. it is? Those are those records are impeccably arranged. You know, because that was that was the, the time when. You didn't go into the studio well, and figure out an arrangement. It was yeah, but it was like it was arranged you first. You know, you it was a song that was written and arranged, and professionals, uh, you know, everybody doing uh, a great job and whatever, mm -hmm. whatever their, you know, assigned role. I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass you a little bit. Everybody, everybody that watches the show knows that Teddy Riley is my hero. I'm I'm yeah. I'm I've ripped off so much from Teddy. I, I mean, I, we should call it. Teddy's place, or Pensado's place, parentheses, Teddy's place. I mean, and Dave was the guy that kind of, I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm going to embarrass him, but Teddy is, is beyond question in terms of his talent, but Dave came in at, at just the right time and just kind of helped get all of that mm -hmm. organized and fed out to us. I don't know how to describe your relationship with Teddy, but I, the you're combination right. I, I was of lucky. you and I came, Teddy was... I, I, I was I was in the control room. I was an assistant on like the first guy record, and uh, and then I got the opportunity when they started on the next the next. Actually, even before the next record, um, they were do, you know Teddy was doing remixes like crazy, and, and uh, the engineer they had couldn't make it. He was on vacation or something, and they said, "You want to mix this song?" And it was uh, Soul to Soul. Remember Soul to Soul? Oh, yeah, yeah cool. We did a remix of Keep on Moving. And yeah. Then oh, wow. That I was, did a solo thing with Karen Wheeler. Oh, yeah. Ron Perrin great. Did, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, and then it just, it stuck. And, and you know, I spent probably two or, no, almost three years with Teddy. I learned everything. Was, learned was everything from on, him. On, on Jam, was he using the uh, Roland, uh, the 440 drum machine? Uh, well, no, well, Jam, well, you know what? He was still using the MPC. But he was using the uh, notator on the Atari back then. Well, too, he was, he? yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, he was using, but it was, that was just when he started that year, I think, he was using notator in, on uh, the Atari. And, uh, but I remember for the Michael project, he had just gotten a whole new, he was like, I don't want to use any of my old sounds. I don't want, you know, I want to bring something totally fresh to this. And he went out and got all new sample libraries and, and mm. sounds and we wow. started making sounds and stuff and uh and he you know he just was like inspired oh, to yeah. bring you know his best and he did a footnote for for you guys that are into the history of all of this notator later became logic <laughs> oh is that true yeah i didn't know yeah, that it's the that same makes company. sense because yeah. it does have a yeah. similar 
But, feel. but it, it can be argued, and I, 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 uh, next time I, I talk to Teddy, I'll get a quote to verify this, but I'm not sure things ever felt or grooved better than Notator on the Atari. It, that was just well, yeah, and, Ted, and that was Teddy's thing. It was all about the groove and the feel. Sure you know, he was it's sure like you was. could yeah. not shake that out of him, man. Yeah. He's a lot of guys, including me and Drew, want to know Herb to a lesser extent. Um, Thanks for thanks for selecting my interest level. In the <laughs> That's a Canadian thing, dude. But um, you and Teddy found a way to make sub bass and eight oh eights coexist in the same environment, and and a lot of people want to know when you're working with an eight oh eight. Um, we've had some guests that are basically, well, I don't really do much. I just turn it up or turn it down. And then we've got other guests that that uh, will put a fat so on it or do right. other things. When you're when you're down there below 60, 80 cycles, yeah. What's your thought process to keep everything audible and to keep everything under control? Yeah. Uh, do you do you approach it from a compression, from an EQ, or just just l levels or? Well, you know, with the 808 stuff, yeah, as you know, it, sometimes that'll be in addition, they'll be using that as, as, as really only trying to fill up that sub area, mm -hmm. and there's other kick drums or whatever, you know, uh, that are taking care of the mid-range so that mm -hmm. you can hear it when it's on smaller speakers that don't go that far down. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, that's always, to, to me, the, the thing is you want to listen on some really small speakers like this you know I still have a Studer A80 mm -hmm. half-inch machine that has the speaker built inside and I listen on that it's on more tones speaker. yeah um, you know you obviously you're not gonna you're not gonna feel that or hear it uh, on those kind of speakers but if you can feel the harmonics of it and that's usually what if when I'm listening on there if I can't hear anything anything I'm gonna try and find a way to add harmonics to it so you know, just some distortion. And, uh, Do you ever look at it as a battle between between the bass and the and the and the and the kick, and and something has to win the battle before you even sit down? So, like some songs, you let the the, the sub come from the bass. Some songs, you would yeah. let the sub come from the kick. You ever yeah, think like well, that? Yeah, well, that's what we were talking about before. Yeah, if there's things competing, and you know, most of the time, the bass and the kick are are kind of together. So uh, they're not so much competing for. Uh, you know, a, a part. Uh, you know, like they'll they'll work together. So you have you can kind of choose which one you want to feature more. You mm -hmm. know, it's like uh, it's not because it's it's not working, but it's like okay, well, what do I, you know? Is the downbeat more important here, or is the movement in between the downbeats more important? Yeah. You know? And and you tend to think of compression as a way to lengthen bass notes. Can you kind of? Uh, can yeah, you, that that's that that's a very unique thing. Uh, but the but length on the bass for me is everything, because mm -hmm. that's that's part of the rhythm, you know, and it's a big part of the rhythm. And so you need, you know, I always go kind of to the back of the room, where you can really hear the bass. Where it's loading to, up. Yeah, where it's loading up, and and uh, and see where it falls. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, so are, are you manipulating the release time on the compressor? Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, I like the, the transient designer a lot for that kind of stuff oh, wow. and, and where you can really just kind of fine tune it yeah. just easily. Um, Make a note of that, Drew. Transient designer, we'll yeah, that's that. a great we'll invention. We'll about an hour you like that? from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, all that stuff, you know, all of it kind of has to be in time, you know what I mean? Reverb, tails and mm -hmm. delays, obviously, now we got it easy when, now that, you know, mm -hmm. all of our delays in Pro Tools, you just put an eighth note and you don't even have to, you know, we used to have yeah. to go around with those charts. And oh, yeah. <laughs> or, I or still do with just impress watch. people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned harmonics. One of the things that, that, that I learned from you was that um, distortion isn't the elephant man. It's actually your friend. Like, like um, you were using the pod unit before just about anybody was, the Line 6 pod unit to get distortion and and then you, then when I first met you, you were using the Sans amp, the little square one. I forget the model sure, yeah. with all the little tiny I think it's DIP SA1, switches. I think. Yeah. yeah, and so and I use the Sans amp on uh, on uh, get the party started. 
Yeah. I use it again on buttons. Uh, I mean, that. Well, that, I, I, you, you, you taught me not to be afraid of distortion. That you could, it would actually, like on bass, it would actually help your ear find, like you mentioned the harmonics right. earlier. You, you can add that if it's not already there through, through quote, distortion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Bass and, you know, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, like probably everybody else, uh, I, I think Chad Blake was the first one uh, to do it, but, uh, you know, I think we all stole that Sans Amp. Uh, trick from him, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't yeah, did know that. Well, think. you know what? It's interesting because I think now that we're in this digital world, that's you know, back in in our early years growing up in the analog thing, we were always trying to get rid of distortion. And the lower you know, the lower mm -hmm. the specs were for distortion, yeah. the more desirable it was, and yeah. so-called better. And then, as we kind of reached that perfection uh, in terms of the, the nonlinear. Uh, distortion. It, it was. Uh, we realized that we miss it, and we we liked it, and and it, it added all these. For you me, know, that moment was the first time I used a GML 8200. I was like, this is really neat, but I turn the knobs and nothing happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have that moment? I love the GML. Yeah, I yeah, do too. Yeah. I used to use that across the stereo bus. Yeah, I still do. Speaking of stereo bus, you and I before the show started, we were talking a little bit about this. Is there something you can impart to? to the newer guys, and, and, and you guys that do this for, for a living, um, a way to, like, a, a way, a way to, to hear that, that might accelerate someone's learning in terms of what to listen for by uh, putting compression and stuff on the two bus? On the mix bus, compression? Um, you know, it, it, de it depends on the style of the music, like e everything does. I, 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 I certainly don't have any set rules or you know things that I do all the time but um, one one that maybe I do is, is uh, on the bus I usually have a very slow attack time because I don't want to be squashing the transients and so even if even if I end up hitting it harder which I usually don't it's usually only doing you know two maybe three DB um, but uh, you know sometimes you want something to really get squashed and these days with the loudness wars and everything mm -hmm. you, you kind of you go farther than we used to mm -hmm. because you know it's going to end up going there anyway so you might as well control it a little bit before when you when you when you have the compressor on the stereo bus and it's sounding good to you and then you bypass it right what is it that you're listening for in terms of a, a benefit that you're gaining from it yeah uh benefit is am i hearing it glue and gel better and on the on the con side, am I losing too much of the transients in the in the the, the attacks? And mm -hmm. uh, that's okay. generally you know. Practice that, guys. Uh, uh, Dave and I were also talking. It took me ten. That little sentence right there took me ten years to figure out. <laughs> I mean, well, I don't, we were talking about this earlier, but I, I remember back in those Teddy Riley days on, with the SSL compressor. Mm -hmm. I used to not. You know, I would always try and use it, and a lot of times would say, "No, it's better. It's more open and harder hitting." Because that was always the, the the thing we were trying to accomplish the most: is <laughs> how hard could the drums hit you? And yeah. so, as soon as you you know, as soon as you put on a bus compressor, mm -hmm. uh, you're you know you're sacrificing that. So it was always very small increments if it was in. Mm -hmm. And then some point, uh, I think somebody told me that you know. Uh, somebody came in the room and was like, "Man, I was over Chris Lord Algie's mix the other night, and he had like 8 dB going on on the on the the, the bus compressor." Well, don't you love those moments? Well, well yeah, I was like, really? Well, I got maybe I can try and squash it. So, so you know, then I started experimenting with it more. I probably use it. I, I always have some bus compression on it now. Yeah, I, I um, uh, in terms of. Our profession now, uh, it's, it's morphed a little bit. When you're, when you're mixing now, what percentage of the time are you actually doing things that could be perceived as, as more in the production side? Not that you're trying to step in the producer's way or produce without the producer wanting to, but a lot of the things we're called on to do now, 20 years ago, would be thought of as production things. Uh, are you finding that like flying things around yeah, and stuff like that? Yeah, you're changing the arrangement. Yeah, because you're 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 a bona fide producer and writer, so why wouldn't someone take advantage of that part of your skill set when you mix for them? Yeah, some people are you know 
happy to let you try things and, and you know, go for it, so to speak. But then, mm -hmm. you know, I try and feel that out as as quickly as I can. Yeah. It's like, how much how much leeway do I have here? Can I, Same here. you know, because some, you, need to know you know, that early. Yeah, you know, yeah. okay, am I just replacing drum sounds or am I, you know, editing out two bars here that I think uh, maybe we don't need those or, you know, it's an option. And you just kind of, th I, I, I usually, hopefully before I start or before I send them a mix, uh, try and get a gauge on how far I can go. And some people, I, I love it when they're like, do whatever you think, you know? And yeah. if we don't like it, fine. It's no problem to, to you know, to go Her back. Men, um, most people would just be happy to have a career with, with Teddy, but then he goes to Babyface. And it was like, and like all those great Babyface records, man. Yeah, absolutely. What was the, did you have to change your whole way of thinking going from Teddy, who was drum oriented, to Face Without LA being less drum oriented? Right. But you still made those records. I mean, I remember chasing those records. Like your snares on those records were like, that defined a, an entire time period. Uh, you, you, yeah. you had a gift for that. You know, it's funny because, you know, yeah, I started off doing those hard-hitting Teddy drum, you know, aggressive things. And, th and that's why Alien Babyface hired me because they wanted somebody, you know, they had Barney Perkins was mixing most of their oh, stuff. He was legend, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, guys, and, Google Barney Perkins, man, yeah. that guy. And, and John Gass, another one, you know, yeah. so the, John the, those, too. those two great, great mixers. And, uh, but, you know, they, they wanted something else that maybe, uh, you know, was... New York thing or something and and then I started doing things for them and, and for me it was it was great because it was you know um, an opportunity like I remember LA said hey you're gonna do the next babyface record and uh, and one of the songs was when will I see you uh -huh. uh, that was a big record yeah but it was just you know two guitars and and a vocal and some percussion you know and it, and it became this it was interesting because at first it was just it was just a guitar and vocal. There was no drums or anything on it. And L.A. was like, oh, it's, I just need some drums, just need some stuff. And he just kind of came in at the mix and put on a whole bunch of MPC percussion, like, you know, mm -hmm. 16, 24 tracks of triangles, shakers, congas, and kick drums and stuff. And so we just, I just built an arrangement out of that percussion and let it, you know, just didn't even touch. I don't think I did any vocal rides on on the vocal, which yeah, is kind of unusual for me. But it was just because it was just a vocal and guitar song, so it didn't need much. Mm -hmm. And built everything just with the percussion parts. And that, you know, at the time was uh, that wasn't R and B, you know, to have acoustic no. guitars and Absolutely you know no. no backgrounds and all this <clears throat> stuff. Yeah. And it ended up, you know, doing really well, and it kind of brought that neo soul thing back into what reverb oh. the reverb you were using sounded like a 251 EMT what reverb oh, were you using I don't remember. Uh, just a beautiful a, I don't know beautiful beautiful like just the decay and uh, ooh, just sweet no idea just like 15 years ago okay I'm always surprised that people can re you know remember that stuff it's like well, we were chasing I it. I mean, if, I you didn't, last if you didn't pay attention to what Dave Way was doing, you weren't working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, he, he defined... Uh, it was the same way from the business side. But that know. stuff changes, you know. It's oh, like, yeah. And then, you know... I mean, John Gass, kind of, too, John. You had to, we, we all had to pay attention to what John was doing. But you know how it is. It's like you do, you know, if you do one thing and it becomes a hit, then everybody's going to come after you to kind of repeat that and do the same thing. And then hopefully you're going to have another kind of hit that... Mm -hmm. that you know, you say, you've yeah, never, you've never with fallen prey to that. Your your records all have a unique vibe, a unique sound. I mean, when when you look at the credits, I mean, how do you you know, Babyface to Savage yeah, Garden remember, to Foo Fighters to? I remember I mean, one week I went from uh, Andrew W K to Chris Bodie. Wow. Like the next, you know, the next day it was like it couldn't have been more opposite. And wow. I love that. I love that. It's like you know more of that. Uh, keeps you sharp too yeah well the thing is it, it also it, it keeps you in in tune with you know what what the core elements are of any pop song you know what i mean which is the vocal and the song and getting the song across the matter everything else is just great I'm, I'm gonna do a favor for you young guys coming up whenever you're mixing and you decide to go outside and take a smoke break of any sort 
or whenever they catch you watching porn on TV and you're supposed to be mixing, tell them Dave Way said you should take breaks periodically. <laughs> when Stop I, watching the porn. <laughs> <laughs> when I first started uh, at Larrabee, I would work, I'd get there, and I would just work straight through, no breaks. I, I wore the pins. I didn't even have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and Dave came to me one day and he said, he said, you know, Dave, you, you should take breaks. Like, we got this basketball thing outside. Let's, every, every, like, hour, let's go out there for five or ten minutes, shoot some hoops. And um, uh, that changed my life. I mean, that really changed my life. Mm -hmm. it, 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 to, to, what happens, Herb, is like, is like you, you just, you get so focused and you go down all these little avenues and you're thinking you're, you're changing music and then you come back the next day and it just is horrible. <laughs> right. But Dave taught me that you can actually short circuit that by by coming back after a five minute break it all sounds new and fresh and you hear your mistakes mm -hmm. and you hear because for me it was not just my mistakes I was losing uh, or hating but sometimes I, I I had good stuff that I would nuke because I, I couldn't mm -hmm. tell it was good you lost your perspective yeah mm -hmm. and so to this day I still Credit and blame Dave for when every, time, <laughs> every time I take a break. We'll, we'll it's, share it's, that. It's, it's a Dave Way moment. It's cool. Now, how's and, your. Oh, well, go ahead. But I'm, I'm being serious, guys. It, it, it's important. Uh, uh, it's really important. Mm -hmm. And. and, and um, uh, I'm, I'm that always was a trying, to, trying to listen to it again as if it were the first time, you know, mm -hmm. you're hearing it. Because yeah. it's impossible to do that after you, you know. But how, did, how did you think about that? I mean, how did you come I, up with that? I think I just it was like, I can't listen to this song anymore. One i got to take time. a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. And, and, and But then found that when I, because for me, always the best time, I don't do this so much because I don't sp spend usually a day and a half mixing anymore. But back then, the mixes were kind of more complex and stuff. And, um, you know, I would get it to a point at night where I was like, okay, I like, I like this, going to come back in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that time in the morning after having, you know, gone to sleep yeah. and forgotten the song, yeah. you could listen to it that first pass and know five things, the most instantly. important things, instantly, and instantly. you're done. And it was like, right. just give me 15 minutes that next day, and I know exactly what to do. Guess and what time it is. Oh, I hope I know what time it is. What do you think? Uh, batter's box? There you go, man. Oh, I thought you were going to say well, it's over. Right? No, 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 no. Over? We're going to throw some questions at you. You know the drill. Our audience knows the drill. And... Dave's a pitcher, and you will knock them out of the park. I have no doubt. This is this is oh, one of my favorite. My <laughs> Fire away, This bro. is my favorite segment. Herb, I got a special batter's box for you today. Okay. Fire away, because we don't have time. We're gonna we're gonna uh, this time, uh, Dave. We're gonna mention some 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 tracks, and Dave's gonna tell us what effect he would choose. So vocals. Um. Well, usually there's gonna be. Uh, are we talking about just the fact, like not compression and right, EQ? Right. No, yeah, no, yeah. Just like, uh, like what, what, what well, would your choice of reverbs be? Well, it depends. You know, uh, depends on the song and and what if if it's intimate, I'm gonna probably keep it as dry as possible. With if there's any verb on it, it's probably gonna be kind of short and more of a room and just a little space behind it. Um, but um, you know, for for long things. You know, I've uh, I've always liked the EMT plates, the real ones, and and uh, but there's and, and some studios in town have great chambers that as soon as I you know I don't I'm hardly working in those studios anymore these days. It's you, like a, you've exceeded your time limit. Oh for, okay. Oh, it's all that's right. This is batter's box. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Guitar. Okay. Acoustic right. guitar. Um. Just EQ. Okay. Yeah, for the most part. So you tend to keep those dry? Yeah, I do. Uh, so. Background vocals? Uh, usually something that's kind of short and exciting. That kind of... Uh, like ghost air on the Orville? <laughs> that, that's probably a little too long, I think. Okay. But unless I made it shorter. But uh, also something that maybe uh, has a pre-delay in it that kind of separates it from the, you know, from the source. What about 808s? Like I said, uh, distortion, if anything. Okay. Uh, probably nothing or distortion. Uh, acoustic pianos. Compression, usually taken off some low end um, verb, uh, you know, something medium, probably. Like medium a, verb. Yeah. Uh, bass guitar. Um, again, distortion, compression, 
probably rarely, sometimes delay, or, or you know, or sometimes reverb. I like adding reverb to the bass sometimes. I know that's like a faux pas. A lot of people are like never put reverb on the bass. Write that down, Drew. I, it can add just that, you know, yeah. that depth to the it that makes, cause especially if you've got a track where everything's very dry, and uh, uh, it can it can really. What about live drums? Is, is you know I like to use the room mics for for space and then uh, uh, you know I might add something else on top of that you know uh, sometimes a gated thing if it's just a little bit or some sometimes I'll use a slate trigger with the just the room samples oh, you know okay. uh, and add that in yeah I love that part yeah that's a great um, electric guitar um, delay. Sometimes short, you know, just as a kind of filler, and then uh, you know, these are all so general. It's it's like yeah. how do how do you yeah. how do you you, uh, know? you know basically just give our you've yeah, done, you've I, done I, an I incredible know the game. job. I know just the game. Give our, just, <laughs> um, on a one to ten, what would you rate that, Herb? What, right, what the answers yeah. or your or your pitches? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what I rate is Drew. Let's get some more questions from our corner office. Uh. Let's fire up two questions for us so we can announce our winner. Uh, for both Daves, um, how does Dave reinvent his sound mix style so that his records constantly sound current? Let's go with Dave Way first. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I like to just change things up all the time. Like if I, I, I don't like to uh, use the same gear and the same speakers even you know I mean I'm, uh, I've got so many pairs of speakers and I, uh, there's the ones that I've had for 20 years that I still depend on but those N S something uh, N -S yeah what are those uh, the black, black and white <laughs> <I guess>. uh, <laughs> um, you know so sometimes I'll I'll, uh, I'll find just changing up monitors for different styles even uh, can can put you in a different zone in a sense mm -hmm. Um, and do, do those changes also make it more interesting for you? Yeah, I, I, I think I don't, I don't like to feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I start to feel like that, I'm like, let's throw that Change out. Let's up. start over completely. On something. Drew, throw another one. Oh, well, Dave's, Dave's got to answer. What about chop liver? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. I'm going to answer it anyway. <laughs> Please. Uh, I listen to a lot of music, and, and I'm kind of competitive, so the way I stay current is mainly by just being embarrassed when I hear something on the radio that just sounds way better than what I do, and, and so I try to understand it, learn it, and filter it through my own set of taste, and try to figure out where the music's going to be a year from now, five, five, six months from now. Okay, Drew. Okay, cool. That was, oh, sorry. That was from Mike Van Olden. Um, next one's from Marshall Anthony Oliver. This is for anyone to answer. What you think uh, a New Jack swing mix made or was different from a more contemporary R&B mix? That's a Dave Wish we had some good. What What was the difference between a yeah, New Jack sorry. swing mix and? A, what uh, would you think made the difference between a New Jack swing mix and a more contemporary R&B mix like out today? Uh, I, my first thought is the drums hitting as hard as they could possibly hit. Mm. Plus, you guys, you guys had a very modern mid-range ahead of its time that's kind of come back now. I don't know if you kind of noticed Well, yeah, that. that's another thing, too. Is I, I think those records didn't have as much bottom as kind of what came later, you know? So the mid-range felt loud? Yeah, yeah, it had that impact in the mid-range. If I, I, if I could throw this in, I, I don't know if this is right or not, but um, a lot of the new Jack stuff used the top-end information percussion-wise to, to really make the track move. Uh, remember the, the yeah. Christmas bells and all that stuff? Yeah. Khalil. We got time for one more, Herb? Or we... Very quickly. All right. Um, <laughs> hold on. Uh, Dave, is it true that the key to a great vocal recording is a highly driven preamp with the ability to get the rid of the noise floor caused by driving the preamp? No, that's not true. Cool. That sounds <laughs> weird. That sounds weird to me, too. I'm sitting there looking at Dave, hoping he'll answer that. Cause I, don't, I don't want to. Uh, did you mention who, 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 who asked No, you didn't want to. No, nah, I'll leave it out. You just make that up. You wanted to know that, didn't you? That was Drew's question. That's why you screwed that vocal up yesterday. This next question is from Drew the CJ. <laughs> this is from uh, Giovara187. There you go. 
No, that was that one. You want to get another one? Oh, they're up there. Are we answering that one? Yeah, answer that one. How did he treat Savage Garden vocals? There you go. I don't know. I'm sure I EQ'd him and compressed him with Ed's reverb. The lesson here is, is, is Dave approaches every mix as a unique experience and doesn't take uh, I don't something, what something you did from one and and apply it to another. Everything is unique for you. You you start over from scratch every time you go into the room. I, yeah. I know that about you. So when, when people say, how can he not remember? It's because memorization is a function of repeating something over and over and he doesn't repeat anything. So, mm -hmm. so. Sometimes it, after the fact you'll remember, oh, I, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that was different and I did that. And it I remember worked. those vocals as being having effects but not sounding like effects but the effects made it sound bigger but I wasn't my ear wasn't drawn to the effects it was drawn to what the effects were accomplishing for the vocal it was very 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 cool you cool. said it in the beginning about ratios so let's just think everything is about ratios and you know just finding just the right amount of reverb or just the right amount of mm -hmm. delay and you know to to work with everything but, else. But you, you tucked the delays behind a beat, too. You had a real long pre-delay, I think. It was, it was pretty cool, real cool. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Will you come back? Absolutely. You have a good time? I had a great time. We got a, done already. Right. We got to thank our, our, our mutual friend, Jamie, for, for uh, implementing my, and expediting my, my, this. My friend slash wife, Jamie? <laughs> we like to cut to the chase, get right to the source. Okay, Thanks, guys. This is fun. I good didn't know if you wanted to embarrass her or not on this show. Uh, well, by the way, guys, let's make sure uh, we can announce that our winner, another international winner, correct? That's cool. Yeah, we have a lot of international winners. Unless you live in America. Pro Tools We just nine. lost our whole American audience. No, 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 no. Come on, we got more coming. We got oh, okay. more coming. So along that line, before we announce the winner, go to our Facebook page this week. We've got all the information there on where you can sign up for next week's giveaway. So make sure you do that. It'll be easier. There's a, you see a Facebook.com slash forward slash Pensado's place um, and we'll have up there all the information so you can enter for next week um, and our Pro Tools winner nine week four is from Dusseldorf Germany Thomas Hans we think that's how you say it Thomas Hans there's his page up on the up on the screen congratulations let's give Thomas a hand Thomas all right well, Drew I don't think you would join us there I think you were typing you um, give Thomas it typing down there very good born. very good um, so, hey, good um, shot on me. before you uh, send us home, we also want to make sure that we thank, uh, we've had a whole bunch of schools reaching out for us and some talking about coming international. I had a conversation with a school in South Africa and um, we're in conversations with a couple schools locally that, that Dave or Dave and I may come see. So thank you for all that interest. Make sure you reach us and uh, Dave, why don't you take us home? Man, this has, been, this has been a fun day for me. Dave, thank you so much. Thank um, you. It goes um, fast, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 It, uh, as, like I say every week, guys, rewind this thing, study. They're, they're, they will just toss something out, and there'll be like a, an entire career in one little phrase, like that thing about harmonics when he mentioned that. You know, go and study, study what, what, what he does, and then connect that to some of the records he's made. And, and uh, when, he's, when he comes back, we'll go into some details on a specific record. But thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for entering the contest. And as usual, a lot of great questions. I, 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 um, uh, I'm getting so many now. I, 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 it's getting it's getting hard. I'm trying to trying to keep up with you guys, but but uh, we've had a pretty pretty tight mix schedule this week, so it's been a little bit more difficult. But keep asking them anyway. And, and uh, some of you guys that say thank you, I read them. I might not answer those uh, just just because of time. Herb's the same way, so um, I, I try to pick a few to to answer. But anyway. I said anyway so many times then, didn't I, Herb? So once again, guys, thanks thanks for watching us and, and keep those cards and letters coming. Uh, I've gotten some, we got some great suggestions for guests. I really appreciate that too. Special again, thanks to Busby for uh, for helping helping us hook up Eric Valentine, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.